So I want to welcome you all to our Global Service Career Showcase, uh, which is being hosted by IU's Global Service and Peaceful Preparation Program. Uh, so my name is Dr. Teresa Nichols, and I'm the coordinator of that program. Um, and so we're excited to have this program as part of IU's Center for the Study of Global Change. Um, and we also have a very close collaboration then with the International Studies Department. Uh, so this event has been co-organized by our Outreach and Communications Assistant, and it's designed to engage students and others interested in hearing the experiences of professionals who work in a variety of nonprofit organizations around the world, within the United States, and in our own community. The goal of this showcase is to raise awareness of the diversity of globally beneficial service work that can be done at international, regional, and local levels. Um, so before I introduce our moderator and our panelists, I also would like to thank our co-sponsors, which include the African Studies Program, the Center for the Study of the Middle East, and the Russian and East European Institute, as well as the Global Center and Hamilton Luber School staff who have been supporting this event. Um, so like I said before, you know, we're very open to questions and answers. There's food in the back. We really highly encourage you to take food. Um, and so we'll just kind of keep this conversation going. Um, so we appreciate Professor Shruti Rana being with us from the Department of International Studies, um, who is also the director of the International Law and Institutions Program, which is incredibly exciting. I'm sure she would be happy to answer questions about that. Um, so with us, we have Hal Beresford, who is a board member of, I'm going to butcher the name of this organization. Friends of Gayle. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and he's also an MBA, a candidate class of 2021 here at the Kelly School of Business. Um, so Friends of Gayle, Gayle. Is, Gayle yeah. is a Colorado-based nonprofit supporting girls' education in the town of Gayle, Senegal. Um, and he is also, as mentioned before, a full-time MBA student and Dean's Fellow at the Kelly School of Business. So his work experience includes Best Buy, Good Judgment Incorporated, U.S. General Services Administration, Booz Allen Hamilton, the European Parliament Liaison Office with the U.S. Congress, Duke University Health System, and Peace Corps Guinea. Um, so he holds an MPP degree from Duke University, a BA in Mathematics from Carleton College, and certifications in Project Management and the French Language. Uh, next to him we have Dr. Jill Long Thompson, a former member of Congress who represented Northeast Indiana for three terms in the U.S. House. Dr. Long Thompson has dedicated her career to education and public service. She was appointed by President Bill Clinton to serve as the Undersecretary for Rural Development at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In this role, she worked with rural communities across the country to create jobs and opportunities. She also represented the U.S. at a rural development meeting of the European Union, traveling to Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa as part of delegation exploring approaches for best administering food for education funds, and she chaired an international conference to advance opportunities for women in agriculture. She was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve as the board chair and CEO of the Farm Credit Administration, a prudential regulator charged with ensuring the safety and soundness of the farm credit system. She has spoken internationally on advancing opportunities for women for leadership and is the only woman in Indiana's history to be a major party nominee for the U.S. Senate. She is also the only woman to be a major party nominee for governor. Uh, she has spent many years working in higher education and is currently a visiting clinical assistant professor and Dean's Fellow at the Intersection of Business and Government at IU Bloomington, where she teaches ethics at the Kelly School of Business and also the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Uh, she has served as a fellow at the Kennedy School of Institute of Politics at Harvard University and has taught at Valparaiso University and Manchester University. Uh, she also holds a PhD in uh, MBA from IU Bloomington, so a proud alum, and a BS in Business from Valparaiso University. She lives with her husband, Don, a retired fighter pilot and airline captain on their farm in Marshall County here in Indiana. And last but certainly not least, we have Andrea Richter Gary. So she currently serves as the Vice President of International Engagement at the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. In this role, she oversees international business development efforts, including six foreign based offices. She also manages relationships with foreign governments on behalf of the state. Previously, she held the role of advanced lead to President Barack Obama at the White House, where she led teams to prepare the logistical, security, and communications aspects for the president's foreign and domestic travel. So thank you all so much for being here today. Great. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Nichols, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, so we've heard about all of these great accomplishments, and I know our students are interested in unlocking some of these secrets of how you were able to do what you're doing. Um, and so we wanted to start by asking about one of your jobs in particular, so either your current position or another position focusing on global service. And if you could tell us what kind of work um, you did as part of that position or with that organization, um, as well as what your favorite part about that job was. So why don't we start here and go down? So. Sure, absolutely. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Very good. So it's awesome to be here. And hi, everyone on the live stream. 
Um, so the position I'd like to talk about is being a board member at Friends of Giggle, which is a nonprofit organization. We've been around since 2005, founded by a returned Peace Corps volunteer, actually served in Giggle, Senegal. It's a town of about, about 11,000 people, um, and she served there in about 1990. Um, so currently what Friends of Giggle does is a whole lot of things, all supporting girls' education in the town. Um, so, we, one thing we do is we've got a, uh, a computer lab and three staff on the ground, plus a few others who help out, and it's the only place where you can do e-learning and learn and actually use a computer below the age of high school if you're in that town. Uh, so really trying to expand just the educational opportunities there. Um, we also just do summer school. We do some some other things uh, that I can get into a little bit later if anyone's interested. I will say that here in the United States, this is a international organization, so we sort of have a Senegal part and we have a United States part. Being in the United States, you'd probably guess and guess correctly that I'm indeed in the United States part. And uh, really what it comes down to is our mission is helping girls education and education in general in, in the town and supporting the educators and families who live there. Uh, so that's really the mission part. The United States here in our organization, we, we're, we really do mission support and oversight. So a big part of it is making sure that uh, we have enough fundraising, making sure that whoever donates really knows that they are a partner and that they really believe in, in you know, Friends of Gale and the mission and are making a difference. So it's on us also to just to show that. Um, you know, so just so just in general, that's that's kind of what we do. The last time I was in Gable was uh, in the summer of 2018, and I can talk about that a little bit later as well. Great. Um, I'm going to use my moderator's prerogative and add us um, another question for all of you to that, just because I can tell you're all going to be speaking about really interesting positions. If you could say a little bit about how you got that position, um, I think that would be really helpful for our students as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say just getting involved is really just the most important thing. Um, how, I got, how I got that position, it's really just an accident that happened over many years. Um, I chose to join the Peace Corps coming out of college, and I went to Guinea, West Africa. And when I came back to Denver, where I'm from, I really miss being part of something international. Um, so I started working with uh, refugees locally, um, they weren't. From, they were from a different part of the world. They're from. Uh, they're from. I don't even know what to call it anymore. Myanmar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seems like the name changes. Uh, but also, I I just sent out emails to to people who lived in Denver who are also our PCVs and connected internationally. And I just said, hey, I just got back from Peace Corps. I'd love to say hi. You know, let me know what you're up to. What's what's it like to have this experience and be here living in Denver? Mm -hmm. and, and one person who wrote me back is Judy Beggs. And Judy Beggs is one of the co-founders of this organization. So I ended up going to meet her and I got an informational interview and we chatted a little bit. And, you know, dot, 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 many years later, there was a need of the organization to help out and we reconnected. So I guess the bottom line would be you know, find something that you're interested in and go for it. And it can be super local, you know, just as long as you just get started, you never know where, where it will take you. Great networking example as well. Thank you. Well, I've actually enjoyed, I think, every job that I've ever had. And um, so I think what I should do is focus on um, the jobs that are most related to uh, work in international um, service and certainly um, serving in the U.S. House on the House Agriculture Committee and um, being the vice chair of the subcommittee that oversaw rural development um, and rural development are the programs that help rural communities across the United States uh, to build their infrastructures and, and build their economies. Um, but also I served on the Select Committee on Hunger and um, had the opportunity to do um, field hearings across the country and to learn a great deal about hunger in other parts of the world as well as in the United States. And then serving as the Undersecretary for Rural Development. 
Um, I also had this opportunity or several opportunities to travel internationally. And the, uh, among uh, my travels, including Africa, um, Europe, Australia, the, the, uh, something that has, has stood out over the years has been, and this is to build on what you were saying, about looking for things that you like to do, but also being prepared. And by being prepared, I mean always doing your homework so that you are familiar with um, the underlying principles of um, whatever it is you're trying to address. For example, um, having uh, studied business, uh, you would expect, and, and you would expect correctly, that I believe very much in capitalism. Oftentimes, people who are very progressive do work in international um, service areas and um, have some negative feelings about capitalism. But if you're going to be prepared, it's important to have the facts. And the facts are that capitalism is actually a pretty liberal concept because of the right to individual property ownership, uh, personal ownership. Not only that, but capitalism works. Um, the Organization for Economic um, Cooperation and Development has some very good information on um, the success of capitalism versus other forms of uh, other economic structures. The um, per, per capita income over the last uh, 50 years, for example, is multiple times greater in capitalist economies than in other economies. And you can't serve people if you don't have jobs that generate income so that people can support themselves. And um, another uh, issue that, and, and this is tied in with doing your homework and being prepared, is ethics. Ethics are very, and I'm now teaching ethics here at, at IU. Ethics are very important to economic growth and development. And the research shows that whether it's um, domestic or international, those governments that have higher levels of corruption have lower levels of economic growth and opportunity. And so whether you're working in um, a, a, a city in the United States or working for a state or a county government, or you're working abroad, uh, and you're working in a particular country, um, minimizing corruption and elevating ethics, is uh, those are both very important to ensuring um, economic opportunity and growth. And so I think being prepared, doing your homework, and running an ethical operation, both personally and um, in whatever job you have, I think those are keys to being successful and fighting um, poverty, fighting um, hunger, and um, developing an economy. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I wanted to choose to talk about my current job here in Indiana. As you can see from my resume, I spent about eight or nine years in Washington, D.C. And I think students uh, often think that if I want to do international issues, I need to be in a certain place. And maybe that's D.C., maybe that's New York. Maybe that's LA. Um, and while there is a greater volume, I think, of opportunities sometimes there, there are also a lot of jobs that touch on international entities here uh, and across the US. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that piece. So as Vice President for International Engagement, there's two main responsibilities I have. One is to increase foreign direct investment into the state of Indiana. So foreign direct investment is when uh, international or foreign headquartered companies seek to have a presence here. So whether it's a North American headquarters, operations, but some presence that puts capital investment, jobs, payroll into the state of Indiana. Uh, so this is exciting because you actually get to see uh, the impact that you have by this investment in your state translate into jobs for Hoosiers uh, and to build communities that way. So we have six different international offices uh, a few in Asia, so in China, in Japan, uh, one in Israel, and then three in Europe, in London, in Milan, uh, and in uh, Berlin. We also have an advisor who covers India. So that is a way that we directly generate leads and interest in the state of Indiana, trying to raise our global profile. The second piece is to handle all of the state government engagement. So that may be something anywhere ranging from planning uh, economic development missions for Governor Holcomb, for Lieutenant Governor, for our Secretary of Commerce, uh, in order to again raise the profile of Indiana and to have interest into our state. We also host quite a few visitors, so I don't think it's always well known, you know, perhaps at a place like IU it is because you get quite a uh, you know, bunch of speakers and all that, but we also have visits for government to government relationships, so ambassadors, ministers, 
foreign trade delegations who come in to do business with our state. So my team handles those visits, as well as engagement with any of the international organizations or entities or AMCHAMs and Chambers of Commerce that are related. So it's exciting. Um, the profile of Indiana, I think, has grown uh, kind of year after year. So it's a great time to be uh, globally connected. And you know we find IU a great partner in that. So as far as getting that job, I actually moved to Indiana. I'm not an original Hoosier. I'm an adopted Hoosier, I like to think, about three years ago, and I knew maybe two people in the entire state of Indiana. So it had to truly start from scratch. There was two things I found really helpful. One is finding a way to describe your skills in a way that translates. So I had to take very niche things that I did for advanced work and try to sell someone um, where that job doesn't exist here. I can't do presidential advance work in the state of Indiana. So how do I look through what that skill set is and have it apply to jobs that I'm looking at? So I think that's the first thing is what is the vocabulary describing that? And two is just be tenacious in how many people you talk to and in having them open your contacts to you. I think I did probably over 55 coffees, meetings, interviews, uh, because I wanted something in the international space and was able to um, eventually get connected to the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, which is basically our department of Commerce equivalent uh, and find this job. So it did take about four months, but it's keep going, keep going. And when you find someone who's, you know, may have a lead or a contact, ask them, well, can you introduce me to three other people? Um, and that was how I was able to come into this position. Thank you all. I think that was such a fascinating look at um, these multiple levels you can work on, right? International, national, and local. Um, so I want to move on to our next question, and I'll add a little bit to that again, um, just to make it more concrete. So our next question is to um, discuss how your job or previous experience addresses or intersects with global issues. And um, what I wanted to add to that, or maybe reframe it a little bit, is that I think, um, you know, I found Dr. Thompson's discussion of um, anti-corruption efforts and the rule of law and the relationship to markets and capitalism <clears throat> to be um, so fascinating, and I think one of the challenges for our students is that in the classroom we study these really interesting issues like promotion of democracy or um, anti-corruption efforts or something like that. And um, you know, for students who are really interested in those issues, it's sometimes then hard to figure out how do you get a concrete job out of that, or what are the positions where you get to work on some of these global issues that you've talked about. So I was wondering if you could. Um, tell us a little bit either about your jobs or previous experience and their in intersection with global issues um, or the types of jobs that students might be able to get or um, think about um, in terms of their careers if that's an issue that they're interested in pursuing. So hopefully that wasn't a too complex question <laughs> to throw at you. But, um, and I guess we can start with, with any of you or we can keep going in order, whichever. I'm, I'm happy to start. Okay. Thanks. Um, I have always been interested in the cooperative model of business. Credit unions are a good example of the cooperative model where you have um, a group of people who form a business and it's not for the purpose of generating profit, um, it's for the purpose of running a successful business and then um, if there is a profit it gets returned to those owners in the form of a patronage payment. Rural electric co-ops um, are another example. And um, something that I found very um, significant about that was that if you if you understand the economic that economic model, and you're trying to build um, opportunity and build business in a country that or a community where there's not a great deal of money, and the rural electric co-ops formed because the investor-owned utilities. Uh, many years ago did not want to invest in rural communities because there was so much distance from house to house and from farm to farm. And so rural families didn't have access to electricity. And um, although he wasn't the founder of rural electric co-ops, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he was president, um, initiated a policy that was very friendly to the formation of more uh, rural electric co-ops. And so understanding how that business model works um, and uh, having the uh, rural co-op services under my jurisdiction gave me an opportunity to actually work with uh, folks in South Africa to build their own, to, to create their own credit union. And I, I uh, must acknowledge that it was a staffer of mine who brought this to my attention and, and he did virtually all of the work on it, um, but it was, it was needed because um, as, as um, these individuals were working and getting paid and 
walking home from work, they would often be robbed of their pay, of their basically um, their pay for the week. But by forming the credit union, they were then able to um, deposit it and um, draw on it. Uh, at that time, it was checks as opposed to debit cards. Um, but they were then able to basically, in a very basic sense, um, manage um, their money and hold on to their money. Um, I also um, would like to introduce you to a, an agency that you may not be familiar with, and that is the Foreign Agricultural Service. If you like international work, um, the Foreign Agricultural Service might have opportunities that would be um, very interesting to you. Uh, the Foreign Agricultural Service uh, works to, uh, and, and there are, they work with State Department officials uh, across the, the globe, and work to advance opportunities for sales of um, farm commodities from the United States, but also other, um, they, in doing that, they get involved in economic development as well. Um, so there, there really is this um, other side to the work that they do. It's very, very interesting. A lot of people don't uh, know about the Foreign Agricultural Service, but you can find it at fas.usda.gov. And um, they have openings, uh, they have uh, job um, announcements for entry-level positions as well as um, positions for people who have work experience. But I think that um, you, you might find that one that is of interest. Um, but I, I'm a firm believer in co-ops. In fact, the last position that I had in the federal government as head of the Farm Credit um, Administration, um, the lending institutions that we were responsible for ensuring the safety and soundness of the system uh, those are co-op owned uh, lending institutions. They're owned by the farmers that borrow from them. Thank you. And would one of you like to take the next? Sure. Okay. No, I mean, following along that, I think when we think of international, it doesn't have to just be, you know, government. It doesn't have to be you're working at the WTO to do trade issues. It cuts across industries as well. So um, prior to my service at the White House, I spent six years at the U.S. Department of State, um, all in different offices focusing on economic statecraft. And that's kind of the nexus of the role of government um, and diplomacy in spurring economic prosperity. So one of the jobs I had was chief of staff to the Bureau of Energy Resources. And this is where we sought to use energy as a tool for stability uh, and security. So one deal that was really interesting was uh, we worked with Israel and Jordan. Now those are two countries that have a storied history and don't always talk directly to each other. But Israel had large natural gas reserves, uh, Jordan had a projection of energy shortages over the next um, you know, 10 years as well as other areas in the region like Egypt and Lebanon. And the idea was to bring together a wide variety of stakeholders. So the State Department is the convener, but you had to work with officials from the Israeli government, from the Jordan government, from energy companies who were the providers of this. So that's another area you can work for industry in the international field. Uh, we had to work with legal teams. We had to work with the UN, um, all to try to broker kind of a third party agreement where gas can flow from one country to the other. Again, through a third party so that they didn't directly have to sign an agreement, which would not have been in line with their foreign and national security policies. So in that whole space, you could be working on the UN side or the State Department side or working for the Air Potash Company or one of the um, you know, energy lawyers who's helped brokering this deal. So there's a wide spectrum if you want to work on that space where you don't just have to think, oh, I have to be you know, at the State Department, I have to do this. So if there's industries that you're interested in or technologies, look for companies or stakeholders who operate in that space, and they're likely to be an international angle as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. So this is an awesome question, and I love, I love everyone's perspective. It's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the way I'd respond and, and try to add some value on, you know, what did you do that intersected internationally, and how did you get there? I think that's basically kind of the most important thing. Um, it's really hard. I mean, you are your own individual. And it's got to work for you. I can tell you it worked for me. And maybe it would work for you, but probably not. Probably there's a variation that would work. Um, I, the way I started working internationally is I, find my, I, I found myself in um, southern Minnesota, in Carleton College, majoring in math. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do? 
after I graduate? What am I going to do? And I was trying to think about it, and I tried to figure out some ways where I could maybe make something happen internationally. And for me, it was really the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps, I, I ended up applying for the Peace Corps, and I made it through, you know, the health, the health exam. That was, that was the worst part, honestly, um, because you can get kicked out of that really, really quick. It's not everyone passes it. And also, there was an insurance thing, and they charged me 800 bucks for, for that, which is a big pain in the butt. So be very careful. Be very careful about where you go. Um, but I mean, for me, that was the on-ramp. So I, I think if Peace Corps sounds, if you're interested in this, if you're curious about international, I think Peace Corps is a really good thing. Um, I'd say some things that aren't as good uh, or, or weren't as good for me. One, applying to things online without knowing people, really bad, really bad. That's just screen time. That's just going down the tubes. Um, going anything through USA Jobs, really bad. I'm, I'm sorry if anyone is a USA Jobs fan, but really bad, not, not very helpful. Unless you're coming back as a Peace Corps volunteer, in which case you have a special hiring uh, bonus and it's easier to get hired, in which case please apply for something, something. Like get that job in DC work for a little bit. But right now, don't do it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, if you are interested in a DC job right now and the Peace Corps is not for you, check out, check out government contractors. Uh, that, that would probably be the easiest place to look. Um, when I was living in DC and working in DC, at my first DC job, second DC job, was at Who's Allen Hamilton. And there was actually an IU alum who I met there, who came there straight out of undergrad. She's really cool. I haven't talked with her in years, but she seemed to really, really like DC. So I, I'd say that if you want to go that route, that's a really good way to go. Um, Foreign languages, I'd love to chat about foreign languages for a second. My experience with foreign languages, which is all I can really talk about with any confidence, is when I was growing up in Colorado, I took high school French. And it wasn't for a good reason. It's because I had one brother studying Spanish and one studying German. And I wanted to be different. So it was, like a, it was a stupid reason. <laughs> stupid reason. But... <laughs> Uh, but I got started with it, and it was really interesting um, to get started. I, I, I will say that there was one thing that I misunderstood in the beginning, and that is that correctness doesn't matter. Actually, it matters a little bit, but it's not the important thing. It, it, and, and it took me so long to learn this. Like, the most important thing for learning a foreign language is actually um, connecting with people and supporting them, and maybe in some situations, you do, have to, you, you do have to ask for what you want. If you're in a different country, I'll just use a, a simple example, you have to ask for what you want. If you're at a restaurant, like, don't be shy about messing it up. You want the turkey sandwich, you ask for the turkey sandwich. And it doesn't matter if you get the grammar wrong, you ask for that turkey sandwich. Um, and I, I will say that, you know, not only do you get more done, not only are you, are you happier, um, you know, but, Honestly, people respect you more because they can feel that confidence and they know that you're there not just to be correct, but you're there to connect, which is what we all want anyway. Um, so, I mean, take it from someone who grew up in an all English environment and felt always wanted to leave on some level, <laughs> even though I'm, I'm back in, you know, I'm not in Colorado right now, but, but um, you know, don't make it about the foreign language, make it about connecting. Um, so anyway, those are just three things that, are, that, that I would kind of point you toward if this sounds at all interesting, um, international stuff. Peace Corps, great on-ramp, uh, networking, talking with people, connecting one-on-one, totally. Foreign language, be understood, but make it about connecting. Don't make it about being correct, because that's a losing battle. Um, and finally, if you're trying to go to DC, go to DC, uh, like right now, if you don't have a special hiring authority or something, I hate to say it, just go as a contractor or don't go. Oh. <clears throat> well, great. You actually got us started on the next question, which gives me an excuse to ask okay. another question to that question. <laughs> um, so our next question is sort of going from the broad to the specific, which is, 
Um, how do you use language or and or I guess international or multicultural skills in either your present job or um, over the course of your career? And what I wanted to add to that is I think all of you have given really interesting descriptions of government related work or adjacent to government work, I think, or like the contractors that you were talking about. And so we have a lot of students who have great language or intercultural skills, but might have issues with a security clearance, either because they're dual citizens or not US citizens, or they might have spent a substantial part of their childhood in another country, which would make a security clearance difficult. So I was wondering if you might also add a little bit about how um, students might be able to get positions in the areas that you're discussing that might not be directly government related or where they might not have to go through something like, um, you know, the, the health screening or the, the security clearance. So, yeah. and I guess you, well, I don't know, yeah. this way. Yeah, I, I, I'd be happy to jump in there. Yeah, so I mean, if someone, um, there, are lots of, there are lots of barriers to, to entry in DC. This is definitely a huge one, um, gigantic. Um, I would say that, you know, if you wanted to get started and you were running into that, you know, I'm, the first thing that pops to mind, weirdly, is, is the European Parliament. Because I know that's not DC, I know that's Brussels slash Europe. But when I was working at interning at the European Parliament Liaison Office in, uh, in Washington, D.C., some people there actually told me that, yeah, it's super hard to get a job in Europe. Uh, but if there's a European Parliament uh, representative who wants you to work for them, it actually doesn't matter. If they want you and they want to bring you on for a little bit or whatever, you can actually do that. I don't know if that's true anymore. I would assume it is because it hasn't been that long. Um, this is 2013. Okay, it has been a little long, but so so that's one. Um, I don't know if it's the same in Congress, uh, but, but it, it might be the same. Um, and I would say that uh, other ways to get involved. I mean, honestly, I guess the last thing I would say is just kind of take a take a long term to it. Um, you can't always get where you want in the short term, but. If you set a long-term trajectory, sometimes you can build up to. So even if it, if it is, you know, a campus job or something else, um, I mean, if your plan is to work internationally, I guarantee that you can find a campus job with skills that are totally relevant to that, and you can leverage those into connections and into bullet points on your resume and your LinkedIn that can get you to the next step until you, until you build it. I don't have the specific experience to um, offer advice on how to get a clearance, um, how to um, go work through the, the details of the process for getting employment in a foreign country, but I can speak more generally, and both Andrea and Hal have already talked about this, um, it, it's encompassed in the concept of social capital. And social capital is a capital that you build, um, even as you spend it, um, by getting to know other people, working honestly with them so they know that they can trust you, and not just trust you in, in terms of um, keeping your word, but trust you in terms of your ability to, to perform a, a task, to do a job. There's a, a very good TED talk that you can find online. The woman who gives the talk, her name is Margaret Heffernan. She's very uh, successful. And she starts her remarks uh, with a story that I've never verified, but I have no reason to believe it's not true, about um, a study that was done at Purdue University on chickens. And um, the study looked at highly productive chickens, and that would be measured by the number of eggs that they produce and chickens that were just average. And over time, the average chickens actually uh, produced more eggs because the highly productive were very competitive and pecked each other to death, according to Margaret Heffernan in this TED Talk. And I think it applies to humans as well. You don't have to be the very best at something, but you have to be good, which means you have to be prepared, you have to uh, be trusted, and you have to know people. And the, having worked in Congress as well as in the executive branch, I have observed that the people who are the most successful, um, they get to know people, they trust those people, those people trust them, 
so that no matter what problem comes up or what you're trying to address, you know whom to call um, to get an answer. And then the other is that they are very good at making tactical and strategic decisions. Let's say you want to uh, work in a particular job in a particular country, but you don't know how to get that job. Then if you have social capital, you can reach out to people who could be helpful in applying for the job. But in addition to that, um, you have this ability to um, find out about other alternatives through the people that you know. And you make a decision based upon what your alternatives are. So let's say that you uh, want to work in the, uh, you want to join the Peace Corps, and that doesn't look like an option for you for there's something that's getting in the way. What other options do you have? And of these other options, which of them would lead you to the kind of work that you want to do? And whom can you talk to? So uh, to help you to help you get there. You could, you, we've seen this in the last several days in the Democratic primary. A number of people who wanted to be president, they decided, you know, I can stay in this race, or, and that's one of my alternatives. Another is to get out of this race and take another path toward achieving the goals that I want to achieve, which are making changes in the country or making changes in the world. So being realistic about what your options are, always thinking about other alternatives that might help get you there, might take a little longer, and you may never get the exact position you want, but if you get something that's close, that's better than not getting anything. And um, build, building social capital is very important to success. Being truthful is very important to success, and being realistic. Um, that's what I say as a 67-year-old who's had a, a career. My career goals when I left high school were to be a professional baton twirler. I graduated <laughs> from high school before Title IX was the law. And I had no idea what job opportunities were out there. And um, I, I had a very circuitous path to get to Congress and to get to um, two Senate-confirmed positions in the executive branch to be a college professor. Um, it just, um, but when I had alternatives, I picked the best one most of the time, and um, it, it all worked out. And I'm going to retire soon. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to jump in? Is that what, or? I just wanted to add two supporting thoughts to back up to what Dr. Thompson just said here. One is on the subject of preparedness. I'm a big example guy. Um, I, 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 there are a lot of great examples. Angela Merkel is one who pops to mind as someone who's just ridiculously awesome at being prepared all the time. If you read anything about what she has done in the past and how she got to where she's gone, uh, I'm, you will see a case study in what Dr. Thompson was just talking about. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, I just wanted to, to say that there's one, more, there's one more job that I would put on the list of DC if you wanted to go straight there besides contractor. And that would just be uh, an aide in Congress, a congressional aide. Congress is run by 25-year-olds. It's run by 26-year-olds. Uh, because every congressperson has a staff of, you know, five to 20 people or something like that. Most of them are 25 or less. So if you go there, it's not, you have to find a way to live because the pay is super low, super low. However, if you can do it and you can make that happen and it requires lots of coffees like Andrew was talking about, um, you end up in this place where you can make a difference you're surrounded by super smart people who are going to go do lots of cool things. You need social capital to get in the door. Once you're in the door, the social capital that you have just multiplies exponentially. So I just wanted to add that other job and also echo the social capital piece. And not for profits, too. Not, not for, for profits. Profit organizations would be another alternative. Yeah, I think most have been answered as far as like what other sectors to be in. So I know. We won't take more time for that. But for the language piece, I just wanted to go back to say, you know, I had a similar experience. I learned German and French growing up, studied abroad in France, um, have family in Germany. So, you know, um, when I graduated, my master's degree actually required proficiency in two languages, so oral, written, all that. It was great. I think, although I don't rely on that now, um, when we have to have government to government meetings, it requires such a technical level of discussion that we have to have interpreters so that we can't go back and you know, there was a mistake because I didn't say the right word or chose a different word. So 
you know, but I think to that point then, um, if you like language learning and that is something you really want to do, there are roles to be interpreters, to work at organizations where you need to have a fluency um, and that we contract out, we use, that can work for the government um, and sometimes um, security clearances and other things are different for those where we need to have that in critical languages. I mean, IU alone, we're standing in a place that looks at critical languages and, and gets, you know, federal grants to have that, you know, going to the Peace Corps, going to the U.S. State Department, other places, the federal government will pay you to learn some of these languages, and then you can use that later in life. So if you enjoy that piece of it too, um, it can be a really um, great asset for any international career. Great. Well, thank you. Can I, can I add one thing on that? I, I totally agree 100%. And I would also add, though, and just re-echo the kind of be realistic, being an inter interpreter into English, if you're from here and you grew up speaking English, that's realistic. It takes a ton of work. Being an inter interpreter into French, into German, into another one of these languages is totally, in my opinion, not realistic. Because you're going to be competing with people like a Swiss person who spoke all of these things from the age of nothing. And you're never going to get there. So, and, and absolutely, um, I would also just totally agree. In that situation, what I mentioned about being correct, yes, maybe you need to be, you might need to be more correct in that situation, for sure, or just not speak it. Um, what I said earlier about connecting with people, that's definitely making stuff happen on the ground and connecting with people, so. Thank just you. Add a little color. Um, so I'd like to move um, again back to sort of concrete skills. So our next question is, what skills you de did you develop or wish you had developed as a student that would have benefited you in these various career paths? Um, or to flip it the other way around and saying, as a supervisor, what kind of skills would you want your employees to have as they enter this field? And maybe we can start at the yes, end. That's right. great. No, I know exactly what it is. Uh, so writing and briefing. So I think a lot of times in academic institutions, uh, you write lengthy papers, and that's great. That teaches skills of how you research, how you really put together thoughts and theories and things like that. Um, I had a class at Georgetown in the first year there where it was taught by the former uh, deputy at our mission to NATO. And, you know, he goes, okay, you get one page. And you go, what? The, the Balkans joining the EU? I have to write in one page? Yes, you have to write it in one page. And I, just, I still look back, I had some of those papers I kept where he was just crossing, you can't use a smaller font to fit more. And then it made more sense a few later when I worked, a few months later when I worked at the State Department and years later. You know, principals are busy. Um, they only have so much time. And if you can't coherently in one page get to what the objective is, what the talking point is, what you're trying to achieve, that's all the time you have. So learning how to write in that way is a skill that I think is rare. Like I find it even when I have you know, other staff or other team members, um, it takes a lot of work to be able to thoughtfully put that out. And then the flip side of that is, you know, when you need to explain something concisely, I used to brief the president. That's an extreme example. I had 30 seconds to a minute to maybe do everything that he could as he was walking from the car to the door before he met a world leader. I sure is better get to the point and I better say it in a way that was understandable and is ready to go. I mean, that's the military, that's a lot of places. So I think if you can learn to communicate in that way, um, you'll be very effective in a whole range of international issues. Um, and it's not just because it's international, but it's how these high stakes jobs can usually come. Thank you, that was a great example as well. <laughs> Am I next? Mm -hmm. um, just building on that, I would say how to frame an issue so that um, it's clear um, what you're talking about. So not only are you keeping it brief, um, but you know how to frame it so that you are including all of those issues that, uh, all of the related issues that matter. And then in addition, how to get along with people. And that varies uh, from person to person because you have to be true to yourself and not be a phony because people pick up on that. Um, but how to disagree, how to tell somebody that you think their idea is not the best idea for moving forward and do so in a way that uh, keeps them uh, interested and so that they're not putting up barriers, but so that they are um, willing to continue to work with you. Um, and, and so uh, framing issues and getting along with people even when you have to disagree with people. I think those are very important skills. 
I have three. One of them, though, is just totally echoing to get along with people. Uh, that is super key. Um, I think one example, just historically, would be uh, he's retired now, but PBS interviewer and, and TV personality Bill Moyers. Uh, he served as an, I believe it was an aide. I think it was in the Kennedy White House, might have been LBJ. I can't remember. But the story that I read about him is that when he was there, he was the youngest guy in the room and he would just ask questions. And he would say, what do you think about this? How about that? And they were open-ended questions where he really was being himself and trying to learn. And by the time he left the room, the people who were in the room who were extremely distinguished people would say things like, who is that guy? Like, how is he so smart? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, he just found that way to just ask questions and respect the person he was talking with, but also get a lot of great information. And in that way, like build bridges, very constructive, just as an example, worked great for him, um, good way to go. I would just, the two other skills that I would add, or, or I'm, I'm really going to make them concepts. Uh, framing, I'm going to borrow that one. Framing is, is super critical. Um, I just... I only learned about that when I did my public policy degree at Duke, but you know, framing can make the difference between uh, this bottle of water is refreshing and this bottle of water is dihydrogen oxide. You know, both are true, but like which one is effective for the situation? And you can kind of a trite example, but wherever you go. And the last one I would say, this one I'm going to try to be original instead of just borrowing and repackaging would be knowing the difference between, this is still kind of hard, from here, objectives and tactics. Um, I'm coming at it from a different perspective. When I was working at Booz Allen, when I was working at the New Justice Services Administration, when I was working at Duke University Health System, my background is basically IT project management. That's what I did for almost a decade, starting with the Great Recession, when I couldn't find a job, et cetera, because that was in demand. And let me just tell you, there's a huge difference between someone who, everyone has a phone in here. There's a huge difference between someone who says, you know, here's my phone, please download Gmail for me. Or someone who says, here's my phone, I'm time to, trying to contact my grandma. Gmail is a tactic. Talk to my grandma is the objective. If the person you're talking with asks for Gmail, when they really want to talk with their grandma, you'll totally fill what they're asking for. However, they may not be able to talk with grandma because grandma may not have an email address or something like that. Maybe she likes the phone. On the other hand, if you go straight for the objective and you, and you just figure out that, you know what, what I really care about is to talk with my grandma, you can use all of your creativity and all of your skills and everything that you know about your phone, which you know better than they do probably, because anyone who's a university student probably knows more than phone who, than an older person. And you can find, not Gmail, but just the very best app in the entire app store, whether you're an Android user, whether you're an iOS user, for that person to get in touch with grandma, and they're gonna be thrilled. So, objectives and tactics, knowing the difference. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and I love the examples that you gave too. They're so memorable, all of you. Um, so I did want to pause and see if there were questions, and I don't know if we'd be able to see if someone online asked a question. <clears throat> I, think, I think so. I think it would show up as a comment. Okay. Speaking of Gmail and yeah. Yeah. technology, <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is my first experience. I, I have a question. Um, as someone who is a little sure of my ultimate goal for me, um, do you recommend maybe like being afraid of possibly going down the wrong path or should I just go for whatever and see what sticks pretty much? I mean, if you would have talked to me in college, you know, when I was at Hamlin University, I never would know what this path took me. I wouldn't say I'm living in Indiana right now doing our international government affairs. I mean, I had no idea what that is, right? I think I knew generally the field that I wanted to work in, the types of things that interested me, and I wasn't afraid to jump when opportunities came. So I got out to DC getting my master's. I tried, you know, the first semester I was an intern for a German company in the second semester I was an intern at the Department of Commerce and then I interned at the State Department working on getting 
our European ambassadors ready for their posts. And then I worked in international organizations and I met some people there that then did advance for the president. And I went on my first advance trip and then that brought me, I just kept saying yes when something interested me um, and when I had you know, something that um, appealed to the background. And you know, there were times when I did advance for the president, I wasn't using my master's degree in European studies, but I was using all those other skills of cross-cultural negotiations of how do I achieve a goal, you know, to the earlier point with a foreign government to get the objective we want for what this trip is supposed to achieve. So do not be afraid of that. I still don't know what <laughs> I'm going to do after this or after that. I have no idea. Um, so I think just keep an open mind and know what interests you and what is you know building towards something even if you don't know what that something is. Thank you. Yeah. And I don't know how you could know what you want to do because you haven't done it yet. And so I, I think just pursuing what interests you now with an open mind and when something else comes along that interests you, um, explore whether that's a, a reasonable option. But I just don't think it's possible to know for most of us, there are some exceptions to that, but I think it's very hard to know uh, what you want to do um, and, until you actually do it. Yeah, I would just add from my perspective, being a lawyer, there are plenty of people working in areas of law that didn't exist when they were in law school. You know, all these different technology, mm -hmm. intellectual property laws and things. and. The best thing you can do, I think, is get a broad range of experience, learn everything you can so you can leverage it in any direction you'd like when something interesting pops mm -hmm. up or comes your way. So I give you a little time to think. I'll yeah. <laughs> I mean, this one is so hard. I mean, especially, I mean, we're blessed. Like, if this was this country 200 years ago, we'd, we'd probably be farmers. And so would our parents, and so would our kids. They would all be farmers. Now, here at IU, there's so much opportunity. Um, it can be very, very hard to know. Um, and yep, oftentimes you just can't know um, just because you haven't had the experience. I mean, as, as far as how to get there, I mean, some, some, some thoughts that, I, that come to mind are, you know, don't let anyone tell you because it's kind of a very personal thing that has to work for you. Um, there are a lot of stories that are just really easy to follow um, that people will give you. And, and, and they're not trying to be mean or anything, but, but someone might say, um, oh yeah, you should just go do this. You know, and then you might be believing that, okay, I really need to go do you know, whatever it is. Um, but I mean, I kind of think back to an experience that I had in, in undergrad once I was talking with my RA, and I'm trying to bring out all the, I'm trying to bring out my old experiences to be relatable here. <laughs> but like I was talking with my RA, and, and I was like, I'm thinking about taking this computer science class. What do you think? And she was like, no, no, don't take that class. I hated it. It's terrible, horrible. Just like she said, so many, so many adjectives about it that were negative, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to take it. Later, I took a computer science class. I'm actually like, this is actually not that bad. And then I looked back at that experience and I thought to myself, she was really coming from a position of, when I took this class, I felt this way. Therefore, I believe that when you are gonna take this class yourself, you would also feel this way. So there's this inference in between where this person is sort of building this equality or something between them and you, which may not be true. And in that case, it wasn't, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. That's why it's, it's such a hard kind of personal decision I'd say some main guidelines that, that work for me, they may not work for you, but they work for me. One, passion is a myth. Um, follow your passion, it doesn't make any sense for me, it's never worked for me, that's number one. Maybe it has for some others. Uh, two, some people never know. I've met people who are um, in different generations and a lot of them have just said, yeah, I don't know, I'm still working on it. So um, you never know what kind of person you'll be. You know, if you're one of those people, or if you're like the, uh, the guy who wanted to be the astronaut at the age of five, or the lady who wanted to be the astronaut, the girl who wanted to be the astronaut at the age of five, and then did it, or somewhere in the middle. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about more recently is just in terms of finding a job or finding a role or, or what actually works. You know, if you find something that's directionally right, 
that's a plus because you can build up that experience and you may not know that I want to be, I'm just going to pick a job. Um, I may, I, you may not know I want to be the U.S. ambassador to, to Japan. You may not know that, um, but you're also not going to get that job. But what jobs, right now, what jobs would get you to that job, you know? And that'll, and that'll help you make a decision between do I, you know, do I work at the international school for my job or do I work um, at Starbucks, the IME, or something like that? Or when you graduate, do I work in cities? Cities make a big difference. Do I work in, if, if that's the particular job, do I work in DC or New York or do I move to Indy? Uh, might, might, be one, might be one of the others. Um, <laughs> I guess the last little framework that I would have that I think about a lot of times, this is kind of a business framework, but I think it applies to, to jobs as well. And think about a Venn diagram with emotional feedback, paying the bills and being the best. So if you can find a job or think about jobs that pay the bills, luckily that's pretty easy. I'm not talking about being a millionaire or a billionaire. I'm just talking about living and you know, being healthy, whatever, whatever your non-negotiables are. Can it do that? B, is there a chance you could be the best at it? Like the best in the world. You know, for example, um, my job is to be, you know, I'm just going to pick something super local, a first grade teacher in Bloomington. Yes, there is a chance you could be the best first grade teacher in Bloomington, best in the world for kids in Bloomington, because you know Bloomington better, because you know. Um, but don't limit yourself there. Pick some. That's a great job for some people, not for other people. I used to be a teacher. Um, you know, feel free to think big. And the, the, third part, the third I would give is just emotional feedback. Like if you can go to a job and then, and then at least get some energy during the day, as opposed to just having it drain out the whole time, it makes the next day a lot easier. This is why I left DC, to be totally candid. Because DC for me, it was not a tank filler. I was really good at my job, but it was a it was only a drainer on the net. And after a while, I just could I just didn't have anything left in the tank. Um, let me just say one story. I know I'm kind of going over, but let me just try to be relatable one more time. When I was when I was at Carleton College, my junior year, I was walking across a bridge over like a lake with the president of the college and another student. And the president of the college said to this other student, and I was, I was like standing behind, I was in earshot, but I couldn't hear what the person was saying, or I, or I guess the person didn't know I was there, or I don't know. But I was hearing the president say something to this other student to the effect of, I know you can do this. You can apply for this PhD program in, in Oxford and go do it and kick ass and you'll be the best, excuse me. And It'll be amazing. And I thought to this, and I thought to myself, well, if he's saying it to, it to that student, I'm standing like one behind, you know, maybe, maybe that's not, maybe I'm not going to have something like that. That person ended up going to Oxford, getting a PhD, they did it. My path was a lot different, not to say it was a worse path or a better path or whatever, but I guess the, uh, another takeaway I would, I would just, I'll just I'll stop here on this question. It would be like, yes, you can go do that Oxford thing if you want. Or whatever your Oxford is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I do think we're out of time, is that right? But um, we can still for maybe... like the, the formal panel. I okay. mean we can keep the conversation going. Yeah. Um, okay. Just one note I wanted to make kind of based on your question is I think what a lot of panelists talk about is they always try to take something new from their experience, whether it was doing different internships or different jobs, but also the importance of you only have so much time, you can't do an internship at everything that's kind of interesting. So thinking strategically about doing informational interviews, using your network, kind of trying to get a sense of people who are in roles that are interesting to you. You know, maybe you can't get an internship with that organization or you don't have time to like spend three months there, but you could also get a better sense of what their day-to-day -day looks like. And if that's something that might then be attractive for you also. So we can still keep the conversation going. I'm just going to turn off the live stream. Can we thank our panelists first? Yes. Absolutely.
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have to thank all of you. I think this has been okay. incredible advice and just really interesting to hear about your careers and the advice that you give. So. Yes, no, we really appreciate you, appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.